Before we start, throughout the video, I'll be asking a few different questions. There's not many, there's just a couple. So if you'd like to, when we get to the questions, you can put your answer in the chat box and follow along. Hello, brothers and sisters. My name is Tina. And today I put together a special topic for us. We know a lot of the prophecies of the Lord's second coming are all coming to pass. So it's very important that we prepare for his second coming. We know how he will come and we know that what he will do because we know the Lord prophesied he's coming back to do the work of judgment. So we're going to look at today. How will God come back to do the work of judgment? All right, so I've created PowerPoint and let's get to it. All right, we know that the second coming of the Lord Jesus is likened unto the days of Noah. And this is prophesied in many different places in the Bible. We can see in Luke 17, 26, it says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. And so this is very important that we understand the details of what happened in the days of Noah compared to what will take place in the last days. Let's look at a Bible verse. All right, let me uh, go to my interaction. All right. So we look at Matthew 24, 37 to 41. It says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall it also be, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Amen. So this is very important that we understand this aspect, right? The days of Noah, we can see in the days before the flood, they were acting normal, right? There was nothing really extravagant happening until the flood came and took them all away. And we can see in this Bible verse that it says two shall be in the field. One shall be taken, the other one left. Now we can look at this from two perspectives. We can say the ones that were taken were taken into the ark, right? When we can say the ones that were left were left in the disasters. Or we can say the ones that were taken were the ones that were taken in the flood. And we can say the ones that were left were left in the ark, right? So either way, we know that in that time, there were people that were saved and there were people that were destroyed. And Noah did not leave the earth, right? Because a lot of people might refer to this as being rapture, being lifted into the air. Noah was not lifted into the air. He was taken into the ark. But the key point is that there were those that were saved and those that were destroyed. And so there's another picture I want to share with you that we need to look at what happened in between. You know, we see that God gave Noah a warning, you know, and told him he wanted him to build an ark. And this ark was for his safety. You know, he didn't ask God what the ark was for. He, God just asked him to build an ark. And so between the time God asked Noah to build the ark and the time the flood came, there was a 120 year span. And what happened in this 120 years was very, very important. We think about when the flood came, was that people living by their faith? Or when Noah was preaching the gospel and building the ark and loading the ark, should people have been listening to Noah when Noah was telling them that he was, that God was going to flood the earth? So during this 120 year time period, we can see Noah was preaching the gospel. He was building the ark and he was loading the animals into the ark. Now when the animals were being loaded into the ark, the time was getting shorter, right? So we have to look at why are the last days likened unto the days of Noah? All right. So we look at between the time we know in the last days, there's warnings of disasters, right? There's warnings of the disasters and the state of the people. There will be wars, rumors, wars, famine, plague, pestilence, and also the state of the people. Many will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. So these are things we need to be looking for. Uh, as for the Lord's second coming, 
right? So what happens in between the disasters and the time the Lord appears upon the cloud? So this is what we need to pay attention to. And this is what we're going to look at today because the last days are likened unto the days of Noah, which is a warning and an ending, right? And there was a lot that happened in between. So let's look at how will the Lord return? What does the Bible prophecy say about how the Lord will return? And I think you're going to be a little surprised on this to learn uh, something new. All right, so let's look at some prophecies first. We're going to look at public arrival. And these Bible verses we're going to read all refer to everyone will see him. But there's also a lot of things taking place. So if we look at Revelation 1, 7, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Luke 17, 29 to 30. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And there's another one we're going to read. Matthew 24, 29 to 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So these Bible verses refer to a public appearance that everybody will see him. If everybody's going to see him, it also means that everybody would hear him, unless, of course, you're deaf. Right, But when the stars are falling from heaven and things like that are happening, the earth is going to rumble. So you would feel something. You would know. You would be running outside and you would see. So the key point is everyone will see him. Now, we have to think about in our mind, what did we imagine of when we would see the Lord coming upon the cloud? We, you know, I know for what I used to imagine, I used to imagine it would be a glorious day. So I'm going to send some, share some picture with you that we can look at of the see if this is what we imagined in our mind, because this is what these prophecies say will be taking place. So is this the scene as we imagined the Lord coming with hundreds of his angels, thousands of his angels. But if you look at what's taking place on the earth, it's like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah when fire and brimstone rained down from heaven, or we know that there's massive disaster. The sun will go dark. The moon will not shine its light, right? It's like after the great tribulation, after the great tribulation, the earth will be in chaos. It will be a mess. It will be a lot of destruction, remnants of this destruction. And the other key point is there will be many, many people wailing. And why, if we've been waiting for the Lord for thousands of years, will people be wailing? So we need to think about these points and we're going to look at these points. And when we're done today, hopefully you will have a better understanding of why people will be wailing and how we need to prepare for the Lord's second coming. So these prophecies refer to a public appearance. Is the day of the Lord just one day and one moment? There should be a process like in the days of Noah. It's not one day and one moment. It's a process. It's likened unto the days of Noah, and the days of Noah was a process. So why do people see the Lord but wail and mourn? If people see him on white clouds, is that having true faith? Like in the days of Noah, when the rain came, was that having true faith? When the Lord comes openly on the cloud and everybody sees him, is that having true faith? We're going to look at these things because we're going to look at another way the Lord will return. What actually happens in between? Very important to understand this. All right, so now let's look at some other prophecies. Some prophecies where not everybody will see him. All right, so in Revelation 16, 15, it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Revelation 3, 3, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So if we look at these prophecies, it's much different than the Lord coming openly and every eye sees him, right? Because we look at all aspects of what a thief is. A thief, for one thing, is we don't know the time or day. 
And this is what we've all been taught, that we don't know the time or day that the Lord is going to appear upon the cloud. But if you look at another aspect of what a thief, when a thief comes, a thief does not come publicly. Not everybody sees a thief, right? That's the object of being a thief. And he comes, he does not come publicly where everyone can see him. And I prepared a picture for us so we can look at. So in this picture that we're looking at, can you pick out the thief? I know I can't. <laughs> who knows who that thief is, right? So this is another aspect we need to look at. So we're going to look at what does it mean, the Lord coming as a thief. But before we do that, let's look at a couple other prophecies that refer to um, also how the Lord will return and some prophecies that need to be fulfilled when the Lord returns in the last days. So Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now when the Lord appears openly on the cloud, everyone will hear him. And this says, if any man hear my voice. It also says that I will stand at the door and knock. If the Lord came openly on the cloud, when is he going to stand at the door and knock? Everybody would see him. This prophecy is in Revelation. These are prophecies having to do with the Lord's second coming. So if the Lord came openly on the cloud, this prophecy could not be fulfilled. Also, if we look at Matthew 25, 6, it says, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. So meaning the Lord, when the Lord comes, there'll be those that will say, Hey, the Lord has returned, let's go meet him. If the Lord came openly on the cloud, everybody will see him. There's no reason to say, let's go out to meet him. There'd be going to be so much happening in the world, there'd be no need for that. So we're going to look at some key points on this that the Lord's second coming is a process. It's a process of open arrival and secret arrival where everybody sees him when he comes openly on the cloud. But there's another way he comes as a thief. Not everybody will see him. Not everyone will hear him. Every single prophecy will be fulfilled. So these prophecies show us they will be fulfilled at different times. They have to be because a thief does not come publicly. Why does it say, if any man hear my voice? So we're going to look at the process of the Lord's second coming. So there's two ways of the Lord's return. There's a secret way, coming as a thief, which is he first comes secretly in flesh, born of man, not recognizable at first, just like a thief before he's revealed publicly as a thief. He comes to speak the truth to open the sealed book to bring salvation by purifying our sinful nature, which we're going to talk about. This has to do with the judgment. Only true believers can identify God's return from hearing his voice, read his words in the sealed book in the last days. And then he will come openly on the cloud. The public way is he appears publicly to man on the cloud to rain down disasters to punish people who didn't accept the salvation and get purified just like as in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, there was a time of saving and there was a time of destroying. So this is what we need to pay attention to. What is this time of saving? And we'll look at another couple of another Bible prophecy that reveals both the public appearance and the secret arrival. This is Luke 17, 26 to 30. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. I underline some key points in here. So there's a time period of in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, he was preaching the gospel. He was building the ark, and then he was loading the ark. In the days of the Son of Man, there are things that he will come back to do. And then he will appear openly on the cloud. 
But we can see in the days of Noah is a time period, in the days of the Son of Man is a time period. And this is the time where we need to be paying attention. Because it says in the days of Noah at that time, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving a marriage. They weren't paying attention. They weren't seeking. They weren't searching. They were laughing at Noah and humiliating Noah. But then it says, on the day the Son of Man is revealed, this is like when the flood came, or also when fire and brimstone rain down from heaven, when the Son of Man is revealed. When something is revealed, you see it, right? It's a revealing. So this is when all eyes see him. But in the days of the Son of Man is a time period when he comes as a thief. So if you understand these Bible verses, it's very clear that the Lord comes in two separate ways. All right. So there's a question I have now. And this question is, since what we talked about, um, you may want to ask yourself this question. So in which way will God return? Is it A, coming upon the clouds publicly? Or B, secretly arriving? Or C, he will come in secret like a thief. Second, he will come on the clouds in public. Or D, I'm not sure. She can ponder over that question for a minute. And hopefully you can answer that question according to what we just talked about. Because the correct answer to that question is actually C. He comes first like a thief, and then he will come openly on the clouds. So now let's take a look at how Jesus himself reveals how he will return. All right, in Luke 12, 40, it says, Be you therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. Luke 17, 24 to 25. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things, and be rejected of this generation. Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So this is the Lord Jesus himself revealing his return. And the key point in each of these Bible verses is the Son of Man. The Son of Man comes, the Son of Man be in his day, and the coming of the Son of Man. And if you look at Luke, Luke is very important, that Bible verse, Luke 17, 24 to 25. It says, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. So it shows when the Lord returns, he's going to be rejected a second time. And the background to this Bible verse is when the scribes and the Pharisees were demanding of Lord Jesus when the kingdom of God should come. And also 2,000 years ago, the entire generation did not know about Lord Jesus, right? So this is not referring to the first coming. It's referring to the second coming. But the key points in here are he comes as the Son of Man. So if he's coming as the Son of Man, we need to pay attention to understanding clearly what is the Son of Man. So let's look at some other scriptures because we know Lord Jesus is the Son of Man, right? Jesus always addresses himself as the Son of Man. He never exalted himself and said he was the Son of God like when um, he said he was Lord of the Sabbath day in Matthew 12, 8. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Or when Judas betrayed him, Luke 22, 48. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Mark 2, 10. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. So Jesus referred to himself in all these instances as the Son of Man. He shows that he puts himself on the same level as man. Now let's look at, is only Lord Jesus the Son of Man? What does the Son of Man refer to? All right, is only Jesus the Son of Man? So in Psalms 33, 14, it says, The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. Psalms 14, 2. The Lord looketh down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Hmm. So we can see this is very important, right? Because we can see all of mankind is sons of man. All the inhabitants of the earth are sons of men. And also in Psalm it says children of men. So a child of a man, a child of a human being is a son of man. A son of man is somebody that's born of man. We 
as humans are sons of man, right? So let's look at a picture of Lord Jesus. What it means is Jesus as a baby as being the son of man. So the son of man is someone born of man having a normal humanity. Jesus is the son of man being born of man. So this is why he's called the son of man. It's very important to understand this. So Jesus was born in a manger. He grew up normally as a child. When we went into the temple, he asked questions, right? And also he grew into an adult. So he had the normal human growth process, just like we do. He didn't fall down from the sky. And as humans, we don't fall down from the sky. Jesus did not transform to be a human. He was born as a human. So Christ's flesh is not supernatural in any way. It's just like we are, right? So we think of coming as a thief. Was not Jesus here like a thief 2,000 years ago? There's many people that seen him, but they did not acknowledge him because they were looking at the outer appearance. So this is what it means in a sense, coming as a thief, coming as the son of man. So let's look at more in depth of what really is the son of man. All right. So the son of man is a title of humanity. And this is well known. You can look it up anywhere. If you look it up online, it shows it. It's, it's been there right in front of us, but we've never paid attention to this. And so this is the key to understanding the Lord's second coming and coming like a thief. The Son of Man is the title of humanity, someone who is born of man and who possesses normal humanity. The Lord Jesus was the Son of Man, the incarnation of God. So when the Lord Jesus said he would be return again as the Son of Man, he meant that he will come again in a physical body as the Son of Man. Physical body, we'll look at what that means. Definition of a Son of Man is a human being, often capitalized as God's Messiah destined to reside over the final judgment of humankind. Now, a little note here, a son of man, I'm a son of man. So a son of man is not referring to a gender. It's referring to a human being. The son of man can be either male or female. So when the Lord returns, he can take any form he wants to. He can take the male form or the female form, right? God created both man and woman in his image. Both men and women are created in the image of God, so he can take any form he pleases. That's very important to understand. So now let's look at another picture, because we're going to look at ways in which God has shown himself to man. In which way, what way do you think he will return? So we have on the left, we have the spirit. So God worked directly from the spirit in the Old Testament. We cannot consider that as being the son of man, right? God appeared in the image of a mountain smoking or a burning bush. God is a spirit, but he can appear in any image he wants to. God's spirit can appear in the image of whatever he wants it to appear in. Now we look at the middle picture, Jesus as the son of man in normal flesh. This is the son of man. And then we also have Jesus's resurrected spiritual body that looks like the son of man. So in which way? do you think the Lord will return? Do you think it is A, the spirit, or B, flesh as son of man, or C, resurrected spiritual body? Most people on this question, they pick C. So we assume that the spiritual resurrected body is just like the son of man, or it is the son of man. But let's look at another picture here. So we're gonna look at the difference in normal flesh and the image of the flesh because the spiritual resurrected body is like God appearing in the image of a mountain smoking or the image of a burning bush. God had to become flesh for him to appear as in the image of a flesh, right? So there's a, there's a difference in their substances. So on the left, you have normal flesh. This is the son of man, born of man. That is the son of man. Now the spiritual resurrected body is not normal flesh right? It's the image of Christ as the son of man. It was not born of man. It was resurrected from the dead. So the substances are different. Jesus, when he was born of Mary, was flesh. He was the son of man. Jesus' spiritual resurrected body is spirit. The substance is spirit. Another example I prepared is like in the days of Lot. 
there were two angels that were sent into that city. They could eat with Lot. Because we might be thinking, well, Jesus ate with the disciples, right? They could touch him. So could them in the days of Lot. They could eat with Lot, right? But they were not sons of men. They were not born of man. They were angels that transformed to look like a human. Angels can look like humans, and they can also go back to being spirits. Humans cannot do that. Jesus, when he lived on this earth, could not do that. So the Son of Man is flesh and blood. It's being born of man. So when the Lord said he was coming back a second time as the Son of Man, it means he's going to be born on this earth a second time. Very important to understand that, right? So this is very, very important. It's something that we've never heard before. But if we understand the prophecies, it's true. So let's look at a question. What is the Son of Man? Is it a spiritual body? Or is it someone born of man? Or I don't know. So think about that question. And the correct answer on that, if we really understand what a Son of Man is, Son of Man is somebody that's born of man. The Son of Man means God becomes flesh. That's exactly what it means. And some people might say, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that God will become flesh. Yes, it does. It says it in prophecy. Prophecy is not written in plain human language. Has it ever been? No, right? Prophecy is like a parable. And so this prophecy of the Son of Man means God will return in the flesh a second time. So it's very important that we look in depth at this and we understand this. And we understand the significance of why the last days of the coming of the Son of Man is likened unto the days of Noah. Because the Lord returning in flesh. Why will God return in flesh? What does he need to do? So let's look at another thing. First, we're going to look at what is incarnation. Now, if Jesus is the Son of Man and we are sons of men, what makes Jesus different than us? What does it mean him being here as the Son of Man, but also being able to do the work of God himself? This is very important. So let's look at some passages of words. So incarnation means that God's spirit becomes a flesh. That is, God becomes flesh. The work that the flesh does is the work of the spirit, which is realized in the flesh, expressed by the flesh. No one except God's flesh can fulfill the ministry of the incarnate God. That is only God's incarnate flesh, this normal humanity, and no one else can express the divine work. Amen. There's another passage I want to read. This flesh has normal humanity, but also has complete divinity. Though in outward appearance his flesh seems ordinary and normal, he is able to take on God's work, can express God's voice, and guide and save humanity. This is because he has complete divinity. Amen. So Jesus is 100% man, and he's also 100% God. So when we think about the Son of God, we're referring to the divinity right? The divinity cannot be seen by outer appearance. When we think of the Son of Man, we look at Jesus's humanity. So Jesus is a combination of humanity and divinity, which is called God in flesh. Jesus comes to represent God. He comes to do God's work on earth. So the work that the flesh does is the work of the Spirit. It's pretty simple, right? It's an amazing thing to understand these things. And so we understand this because God is paving the way for his second coming, right? God will always open up new ways so man can clearly understand and be able to follow. So this is significant. And there's a couple of Bible verses I want to share with you that will help us understand this a little more in depth. And this is when Philip was talking to Lord Jesus. And Philip's asking Lord Jesus, hey, show us the Father. <laughs> and so Jesus says to him, have I been so long time with you? And yes, Hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. John 149 through 11 
So we can see what was Jesus telling Philip here? He was telling him, don't pay attention to my appearance. If you want to see the father, you're not going to see him by looking at me. You're not going to see anything different about me than about you. I'm a regular, normal human being. Pay attention to my words and my work and you'll see the father. Because the words that I speak to you, they're not human words. They're words of the spirit. So this is, this is significant in understanding this, right? That Jesus it says, I and my father are one. So that's why Jesus said, I and my father are one, because it's God in the flesh. God came in the flesh to be the sin offering for our sins. And there's another Bible verse we can look at too, that lets us know that Jesus's words are much higher than man's words. Matthew 7, 28. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Amen. So we can see that Jesus' words, they contained authority, right? It was recognizable that he could teach higher than man can teach. So when the Lord returns in the flesh, we need to pay attention to these things. Right? And then we're going to look at two, some more in-depth things of what God will do when he comes back and why he comes in the flesh. There's significant value to that. You might be thinking to yourself, well, God came and died for my sins. That's the end of his work. What, why does he need to become flesh a second time? So we're going to look at this because this is significant. All right, so let's look at incarnation. Incarnation is a combination. It's two parts. It's complete divinity and normal humanity. The normal humanity is He's a human. He eats, he sleeps, he walks, he grows up from a family. He needs to take transportation from one place to the other. He has normal human emotions such as happiness, sadness, and pain. He can dance, he can sing, he can run, he can do all things that we do, right? He's a normal human being. And we can see when Lazarus died, he cried. So he has some normal human weaknesses and emotions. When he was going to be nailed to that cross, did he not have a human weakness? Yes, he did, but he was still able to do the will of the Heavenly Father, right? So now if we look at the divinity, the divinity is his work in his word. We as humans, we don't possess that divinity. We can never represent God. We are created by God. We can never be equal to God. Jesus is equal to God because he is God. So this is very important to understand the Son of Man and the meaning of the incarnation. So we can look at in depth about the Lord's second coming, what it's talking about, the coming of the Son of Man, and why the coming of the Son of Man is likened unto the days of, of Noah. All right, so now looks at the big question. Why does God need to become flesh again? Hmm. So let's look at this. There's some Bible verses here we can look at. Okay, so what will the Lord return to do? 1 Peter 4.17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. John 5.22, for the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. John 5.27, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. So we can see the work that God returns to do is to do the work of judgment beginning with the house of God. Right? And who does the work of judgment? The Son of Man. So this is a significant value to God actually returning in the last days and doing this work from the perspective of the flesh. And why? You know, if God did his work and judged us from the perspective of the Spirit, could we live? Hmm. Let's look at what the judgment entails of what God will do to judge man, how he will judge man. Is it to condemn us for things we've done in the past? What is judgment really? So let's look at a couple other Bible verses. We can see that judgment is God's love to teach man righteousness. So the judgment is a continuation of learning, right? And Psalms 96, 13, it says, Before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Isaiah 26, 9. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So we can see from these prophecies, it's saying that judgment will take place here on the earth. And when the judgments are in the earth, 
meaning when Christ comes back to do the work of judgment, it will be done on the earth, and he, God himself is the only one qualified to do the work of judgment. Just like God himself was the only one qualified to do the work of redemption. So the judgment work is significant as far as teaching man righteousness, right? Of using the truth to continue to teach man. And we can see that judgment is a love that God has for mankind. It says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And we might think, well, the Lord Jesus came and died for my sins. I don't need to be judged. But judgment is a form of completing the salvation for man, right? It says Christ was sacrificed once to bear the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So it means he's coming back, and this salvation he's bringing is this judgment work. It's the eternal salvation. So we can be free of the sins, right? To get rid of the sins, to learn righteousness. And we might think, well, we're the flesh. We can never be righteous. All things are possible with God, right? All things are possible. This is where our true faith will come into play, is to knowing if God says we need to be righteous, then he will give us that way to be righteous. Romans 3, 10, it says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. So we're not righteous, and yet we're not considered as being righteous, right? So that's very important to understand that. All right, so let me go back to my interact. So let's look at some things that Lord Jesus said and some words in Daniel that talk about, we know the Lord said he'd come back. We talked about how he will come back to open the sealed book. And also Jesus doing the work of judgment, the Son of Man doing the work of judgment, using the truth to do the work of judgment. So where will this truth come from? So let's look at John 16, 12 to 13. It says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So the Lord Jesus himself said there's many more things he needed to say to us. But at the time, we wouldn't have been able to understand it or comprehend it. Right? So it says he's coming back to bring the truth. So this is a form of the Lord coming back to bring this truth to judge the world with righteousness. Daniel 12, 4 and 12, 9 to 10. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. And 9, 10. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So we can see when the Lord returns, he's coming to bring words. He's coming to do the work of purification, of teaching man righteousness. And it shows that he said he had more things to say, and there's words that are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. And through these words, it's showing our knowledge is going to increase. Many shall be purified, made white, and tried. And it's also a separation of the wicked and the wise. So we think of God coming back to use words to judge man. We can see why judgment will take place beginning with the house of God. Those that are God's sheep will be able to hear the voice of God. Those that are not God's sheep will not be able to hear the voice of God. Judgment begins with the true believers, the wise ones, as it talks about here in Daniel. The wise will understand, the wicked will not. In the days of Noah, who was wise? Noah was wise, right? Who was wicked? Everybody besides Noah and his family was wicked in the eyes of God. They didn't listen, they didn't pay attention. And the last days will be the same. We need to be wise, we need to understand, we need to know that what the work God will do when he comes back. And there's another prophecy I want to share in Revelation that's referring also to a book that's sealed with seven seals. And it shows us who the only one that can open this book is. Revelation 5, 1 through 5. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. 
And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So we look at Revelation 22, 16, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? Jesus, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So Christ will return to open this sealed book in the last days. Christ will use the truth as a judgment of all of mankind. So it shows the words that he will use to judge will be revealed when this sealed book is open, and it will be to teach man righteousness also. There will be those that can learn righteousness and those that will not learn righteousness. Right? So we think about the last days being likened unto the days of Noah. We can see in the days of Noah, there were those that, that, that like Noah and his family, they're the ones that had the faith of building that ark. Right? So they were the wise ones. In the last days, when the Lord returns as a thief, he will come to open this sealed book. And the wise ones will be able to hear the voice of God. And it will fulfill that Bible prophecy. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. That is how this Bible verse will be fulfilled when the Lord returns, when he opens the sealed book, when he comes secretly as a thief. Not everybody will see him. Only the wise ones will be able to hear his voice and to follow. And this is also the work of judgment, judgment to learn righteousness. All right, so let me share a picture with you. We'll look at the background history of God's work and we'll understand a little bit about the work that God has done and up till today and the work that God still needs to do. So we think of in the Old Testament, we learned what sin was, right? God issued the laws to Moses and those laws were to teach us what sin was and to show us when you do something bad, there is a consequence for it. When you kill someone, you are to be killed, an eye for an eye in the Old Testament. And then when Lord Jesus came, he came because mankind was being put to death under the law for lack of sin offering. Without a sin offering, what would have happened? All of mankind would have been put to death. So God does his work according to defeating Satan and us gaining the salvation. And then the last days, we can see that we will learn righteousness. God will use judgment with the truth, right? So we can see the stages as issuing the laws and then God becoming the eternal sin offering and then God returning to do the work of judgment. And John 14, 6, the Lord Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if God will judge the world with his truth, we have to go through that truth to get to Christ so we can be righteous, right, to get to God. And also, if you look at the bottom, we can see that in the Old Testament, God worked from the Spirit, and that was to lead and guide the life of man. He used many people in the Old Testament, like Moses you know, and Noah, and people like that, that he could use man to do that work, or he gave people the spirit of prophecy. In the New Testament, God himself came to do that work because no man was qualified to be the sin offering. So the Son of Man first coming was to redeem. The Son of Man's second coming is to judge. So this is the significance of God becoming flesh in the last days, is coming to do the work of judgment. All right, so let's look at another picture. This is a question I have. Who will do the work of judgment? Is it A, God in spirit, or B, the Son of Man, God in flesh? If you've been paying attention, you'll know that it's the Son of Man, it's God in flesh, who will do the work of judgment. So let's look at another reason God becomes flesh in the last days. God becomes flesh a second time to separate people according to kind, right? Where it says in Matthew 13, 30, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn, Matthew 13, 30. And he shall set, set the sheep on his right and hand and the goats on his left hand, Matthew 25, 33. So we can see God comes to separate, right? 
And this is important because we need to look at, you know, about the separation. If God came on the cloud in his spirit, we would not deny him. Amongst the believers, no believer would deny him, right? So there's some examples I'm going to share with you. We're going to look at um, how mankind reacted to Lord Jesus's um, spiritual body compared to the flesh. So let's look at this. We'll see the difference in how man treats either and how they react to it. So the spiritual resurrected body, there's a Bible verse in Luke 24, 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the middle of them and said to them, peace be to you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. So we can see the spiritual resurrected body is not as approachable as the flesh. They were terrified of it. They were scared of it. And if they were scared of it, they would have never rejected, right? They would have bowed down. Even those that didn't know him, they would have bowed down. It's something spiritual. If a spirit showed up in your room, would you not be terrified? I know I would be terrified. So now let's look at the normal flesh. The normal flesh, we can see that these are the, the scribes and the Pharisees, the chief priests. Right? It says, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we? For this man does many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. That's John 11, 47 to 48 and verse 53. So we can see they treated him like an ordinary, normal man. They were not scared of him in any way. And they said, this man does many miracles. So you can see they were, they felt that Jesus was a threat to them because he was a normal, ordinary man. What's going to happen if everybody believes in him? The Romans are going to come and take away everything we own. People will follow him and they won't follow us anymore. So you can see the scribes and the Pharisees, they were the most devout believers but they nailed Lord Jesus to a cross. If God would have came in the spirit 2000 years ago, they would have never nailed him to a cross. So you can see that mankind will show his true self in front of the flesh, right? He will act his true self. And this Bible prophecy in Luke 17, 25 will be fulfilled. The Lord becoming flesh a second time. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Being rejected of the generation means being rejected on every city, every town, every state, every country, every nook and cranny on this earth, he will be rejected by. Why? Because he will become flesh a second time. Think about yourself, how you feel right now. Do you believe what I'm telling you? It's fact. It's proven. It's written in the Bible. So we need to clearly understand it. So we are not the manifestation of these words of rejecting him. It's very important. I know I don't want to reject the Lord. There's another picture I want to share with you. It is says, it is because Christ is the son of man, a son of man who possesses normal humanity that man neither honors nor respects him. It is because God lives in the flesh that the rebelliousness of man is brought to light so thoroughly and in such vivid detail. So we can see God becoming a man Mankind will show their true self. An example I can share with you is like um, an owner of a company, you know, or an employee. A good employee will always be a good employee. They don't need to put on an act, right? Whether the owner's there, or the owner's not there, they're still going to be a good employee. But the bad employee is the one that needs to be exposed, right? Because the bad employee will pretend he's a good employee, especially if he knows the boss is there. He will put on an act, right? He will say, well, he'll come in on time. He'll make sure he's not rude to the customers. He'll, he'll be according to what the boss wants. But the boss wants to see the true self of that person. He wants to see how that person really is. Is he a good person? Is he willing to be able to do his job? Does he like the company? So God becomes flesh will be able to expose man just like it did 2000 years ago. When God became flesh the first time, it was able to expose. The true believers became the false believers, right? So it doesn't matter how much we know the Bible. If God becomes flesh a second time, will we accept him or will we reject him? 
This is going to show our true obedience. And this is going to show our true faith. Like in the days of Noah, the true faith was between the time that God asked Noah to build that ark and between the time the flood came. It'll be the same in the last days. Between the time the disasters come and the Lord openly appears upon the cloud is when our faith will be tested. So what are we going to do? Are we going to believe God will become flesh and follow? Listen for the voice of God? Or are we going to reject him a second time? It's clearly written. So we need to understand this. All right, so there's a question I have. And this question is, in what way do you think Jesus will return first? This is first. All right, so it is that on the white clouds is A. B is as spirit. C is he will come secretly as the son of man to do the work of judgment or D not sure. I'll give you a second to ponder. You can ponder over that. So in what way this is according to what you think. I can tell you what I think. I think in what we've read and understanding the prophecies at C. He will come secretly as a son of man to do the work of judgment. All right. So there's a couple more pictures I want to share with you. Again, going back to the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, what happened in between? We can see from the time that God asked Noah to build the ark until the flood, many things happened. It was a 120 year span. He preached the gospel. He built the ark. He loaded the ark. Now let's look at what happens in the last days between the time the disasters come, the warning signs that we have given in the Bible until the time the Lord openly appears upon the cloud. So we know during this time, the Lord will come back as a thief, as the son of man, or not everybody will recognize him. Only the true believers will be able to hear his voice. He will come to open the sealed book. He will come to do the work of judgment, to teach man righteousness, which is to purify, to qualify us to go home. God's requirement to enter the kingdom is, you shall therefore be holy for I am holy. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. It is God's will, your sanctification, right? So this is God's will to enter his kingdom. He will come back to qualify us through the judgment work to take us home. And he will separate the wheat from the tares. So when the Lord appears openly on the cloud, the only thing he's coming to do is to reward and punish. Just like in the days of Noah, when the rain came, when the rain came, it was to reward and punish. Those in the ark were rewarded. They got to live. Those who were outside the ark, they were punished. They were taken in the flood. So I hope this helps you to understand this a little bit better. So we're going to recap a little bit of what we went over today. And so we're going to look at some key points here. There's two ways of the Lord's return. The first one is Revelation 3.3. 3. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. This is when he comes as a thief. We do not know the time, and you cannot recognize him by his appearance. Compared to Revelation 1.7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. This is where everyone will see him. Right? So there's a difference. Coming as a thief, not everybody sees. Coming openly on the cloud, everybody sees. Now let's look at the two types of people. There's always two types of people. Throughout history, there's always two types of people. In John 10:27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Noah could hear the voice of God, right? So hopefully we're one of God's sheep. We'll be able to hear the voice of God when he returns to open that sealed book. And then if we look at the other verse, he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. So there's those that are God's sheep and there's those that are not God's sheep. So you have to decide which one are you? Are you willing to investigate? And then we'll look at two ways to welcome the Lord's return. Revelation 3.20 is the first way. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So you can welcome the Lord by hearing his voice when he opens that sealed book, the words in the sealed book. The other way is like, again, Revelation 1.7 is by seeing him. 
<laughs> actually everybody will see him. So there's one by hearing his voice and there's one by seeing him. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So the secret way is he performs the judgment beginning with the house of God. He will come in normal flesh and no one knows his identity, but only the true believers can recognize him through his voice. He will open the sealed book and use the words to purify our sinful nature. He will make a group of overcomers before the great disasters. He will separate the sheep from the goats. So there's a lot of work he will do, right, when he comes in secret. It's not just a matter of disaster and coming. There's a lot that takes place. God's ways are higher than man's ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And all these things is God opening up the path to his second coming. He's paving the way so we can be ready, so we can be watching and waiting for his return. So here's a little picture of at the top, a secret way coming as a thief if we welcome him. We would be able to hear his voice, read the words in the sealed book, and we can have the opportunity to go to the kingdom. But if we wait for him to come openly on the cloud, is when there's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth, right? It's like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. If we wait to see him openly on the cloud, every, every kindred of the earth shall wail because of him. So we will have missed the judgment to be purified, right? If we wait for him to come openly on the cloud, it means that we will not learn righteousness and we will not be qualified to enter God's kingdom. So this is how God will return in the last days. This is a great thing. And we need to be able to, we need to be able to understand this. If you don't understand it, go back through the topics. Look at it again. Go look it up for yourself. Go look up what the son of man is, the meaning of the son of man. And understanding that prophecy is something that only God can reveal the mystery, right? So the son of man is key to knowing that the Lord will come back in the flesh a second time. So I hope you like this topic today. And if you have any questions, message me. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. And I'd like to invite you to come join my sermon. And we will see you later. God bless you. I have one last thing before we end today. And this is, what is your favorite ice cream? So if you'd like to, please put your favorite ice cream in the chat box below. That way also, I know that you'll watch the whole video. So when I see ice cream in the chat box, others that don't watch the whole video may be wondering, hmm, why do they keep putting ice cream in the chat box? But if you watch the whole video, you'll know also. So please go ahead and put that in the chat box and we can all kind of see what the favorite ice cream is. Mine is chocolate. Rocky Road chocolate, kind of like the same thing. All right, everybody have a wonderful day and God bless you.